1953 Nash Statesman Super 6. 1958 Dual Gia 400 Concept. It's got Chrysler fins on the back. The dashboard, including the highway hi fi built into the dash. 1962 Studebaker Skyview Prototype. One of the things that this was noted for was the sliding roof panel so that the back, you could put big objects in the back. 1936 Scout Scarab. The back end of the Scout Scarab. 63 Studebaker Avante. 1953 Studebaker Commander Starlight Starliner Coupe. <laughs> this is one of the future liners. They um, have, don't have it open right now. 1952 Crosley Super Station Wagon. Back side of the Crosley. 1950 Studebaker Champion Starlight Coupe. Someone has added Venetian blinds to the back windows of this, which is kind of a nice touch. 1937 Cord 812 Everlane. Nice $4 sedan. Classic design. A 1975 GM Motorhome. 1936 Packard 120 convertible sedan Dietrich body. 1935 Graham model 74 touring sedan. 1928 Essex Boatail Speedster. 1923 Nash 698. It even has a stoplight. 1953 Buick Wildcat. This is the concept car. 1954 Buick Wildcat 2. 1953 Buick Centurion. 1985 Buick Wildcat, where the top lifts up for you to get in. Open engine in the back. The interior. 51 Buick XP 300. 1953 Buick Skylark. 91 Buick Riata convertible. These were built at the Craft Center in Lansing. 99 Buick Celio. And the new suicide doors. Pillarless. Hard top. 1970 Buick Grand Sport Convertible. 1971 Buick Silver Arrow 3. 1957 Buick Century Convertible. This is a production Century. 1953 Pontiac Parisian Town Car Coupe. Backside of the Pontiac Parisian. Dodge Fire Aerial Body by Gia. The backside of the Dodge Gia. 1956 Nash Rambler. Palm Beach, the backside of the Rambler Palm Beach, the backside of this Cadillac concept. 1954 Pontiac Bonneville Special. 1953 Chrysler Thomas Special, body by Kia. 1933 Buick Convertible Phaeton 88C. 1948 Buick Roadmaster Convertible. 2003 Buick Silentium. This was at the International Auto Show in Cobol. 
59 Buick Electra 225 Riviera sedan. This grill is impossible to polish because they're indented. You have to polish each individual one of them. 1949 Buick Roadmaster Sedan Et. This is a fastback. The back side of the 49 fastback 2000 Buick Lacrosse. 1988 Buick Lucerne. For the temperature and for the radio. Nineteen thirty-nine Buick Century Convertible Coupe. The regular sixty-four Buick Riviera. Nineteen forty-one Buick Limited Touring Sedan. Big ride. The back seats. This is a seven-passenger sedan where the jump seats fold down behind the front seats. 1941 Buick 8 four-door sedan. 67 Buick Riviera. The back side of the Riviera. Michael Shoemaker's Ferrari powered Formula One car. Run the exhaust up over the top in order to get that air to go underneath the wing also. 89 Corvette Concept car. Another ASC Buick. Body and exterior by Dacoma. This is a Impala Super Sport El Camino. Another Tacoma Jeep Liberty concept. This is a Ford big truck F-250. That's a three-quarter ton. Operated thermo heaters, power sunroofs, power tonneau covers. 1954 Firebird One. This is a single seater, gas turbine powered. That actually is the exhaust. Two. Now this one here has got twin cockpit bubbles. And this one's got multiple fins. And this is where all the background live music comes from over here on the little stage. This is where the awards presentation is going to be at 1.30. Chevy reflects his personality. 1999 Dodge power wagon place, would bring in technology would see even greater the back end of the, the power wagon. All new 1998 Dodge From ESX2. The, 1990, the fifth VP to head design was experienced in 1987 Dodge Intrepid would reshape the design staff. The this Dodge Intrepid has a rear mounted design, marketing and engineering team four cylinder in the essence of GM brand. 16 valve engine. The unique visual and 1995 Dodge Sidewind. And engineers. In the back it says it's the Sidewinder Dakota. The requirement for 3D 96 Dodge Viper GTS. 94 Viper RT10. 91 Dodge Viper RT10 Indy Pace Car. 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. 1970 Dodge Charger RT slash SE. 68 Dodge Daytona. They came out of the factory like this with this long nose on there and the fin on the back so that they could race. 1967 Dodge Charger. This is a real fastback model. The back side of this Charger with this fastback. 53 Corvette. EX122. 1957 Corvette Convertible. 59 Corvette Stingray Racer. 1963 Corvette Harley Earl. 1963 Corvette Z06. This was a split window Corvette. 1964 Corvette World's New York World's Fair car. 1965 Chevrolet Manta Ray. 
1975 Chevrolet Aerovet V8 rear wheel drive mid engine car 1990 Chevrolet Surf 3 92 Corvette Stingray 2 Stingray 3 excuse me the back side of this where they even made the tail lights the same color as the body and then just think that the light will shine through 2003 Saab 9X 1970 Sonnet 2 65 horse V4 1973 GT2 2003 GTC Genevieve this is opal on the back and that's what I was suspicious that that other one that was up there in front that orange one that's an opal also now this says hold it on the front of it 1970 GTR X tail lights they wrap right around the corners 2000 Celta Spider Chevrolet design Brazil 1977 R100S BMW Red Baron 1971 Honda 500 Banshee 1968 Corvette Astro 2 2003 VX Lightning with a Griffith on the on the grill here 1970 Equus SRV it's another Vauxhall very plain back end Phantom Corsair the gentleman here says it's a 1938 they claim it's hard to see out of when you drive the back side of this really sleek 1938 car the instrument panel it has gauges all the way across 2002 Saturn Sky 1959 Cadillac Cyclone talk about big rubber things sticking out in front for bumpers the back side of the Cadillac Cyclone 1999 Chevrolet Nomad 1963 Corvair Monza SS with a six cylinder horizontally opposed air cooled engine in the back 1962 Chevrolet Corvair Monza Spider GT 1962 Corvair Monza Spider a turbocharged flat six 1961 Chevrolet Corvair Super Spider with six pipes right out three on each side 91 Chevrolet ECC Camaro 1977 Camaro Z28 1967 Camaro Indianapolis 500 pace car 1932 Chevrolet Deluxe Sport Roadster complete with tool kit laid out here 1936 Chevrolet Suburban just doors in the back, a two-door. The front seat slid, I mean, you entered on the passenger side, the seat tipped forward so you can get into the back seat. This is the first SSR that was uh, publicly shown, this purple one here. Now they have them here in, in three or four different colors. They're built in Lansing at the craft shop. 1989 uh, Chevrolet XT2 PPG Pace Truck. 1948 Chevrolet Fleetline Aero Sedan. This is a fastback sedan. There was a time when you could get them fastback or notchback. The first year for the Impala, 1958. Sport Coupe. Impala was distinguished by the six taillights. 1962 Chevrolet Impala Super Sport. 66 Caprice Coupe. 70 Imp Super Sport Cowl Induction uh, 454 
2003 Chevrolet Cheyenne four-door truck. This is a four-wheel drive, four-wheel steer. The two-position tailgate, you see the seam across there. You can open up just the top part. Chevrolet SS 2003. I was impressed with this when I saw this at Cobo Hall. 71 Monte Carlo. 1931 Ford Model A Victoria. He says he has a little problem with his starter or his electrical problem so he's just leaving it run. Beautiful car with a leather top. Two door. Nineteen thirty-two Ford Cabaret V8. Nineteen thirty-one Ford Model A Deluxe Phaeton. That's a, a fancy name for a con completely open car. Nineteen thirty-six Ford Convertible Sedan with a three-position top, all the way up, partly slid back, or completely down. 1948 Ford F1 pickup truck. 1950 Ford Crestliner. 1959 Ford Galaxy Skyliner retractable hardtop. These are built from 57 through 59. 1963 Ford Thunderbird convertible. 68 Ford Thunderbird. 1968 Ford Mustang California Special. 1970 Ford Torino Cobra 429 SCJ. 1948 Ford Super Deluxe Station Wagon. 1955 Ford Fairlane Crown Victoria with a glass roof. That's what was part of the Crown Victorias. The Phantom Corsair in moving and movement. This car is sometimes overlooked. Because I can't pronounce all of this, this is what this is, in 1965, which you might call station wagon, which you also could call it is a nice little two-door. This uh, is a 1992 Vector W8 twin turbo. This car is approximately uh, 36 inches tall, 1975 Lancia Stratos HF. Experimental styling. Back side of the Lancia. 1950 Lamborghini Gemara. This is the back side of the Lamborghini. 1968 Lamborghini 400 GT. What a beautiful car. 1967 Ferrari 330 GT. Long, lean, and low. 1964 Austin and Martin DB5 Salon. 1963 Maserati 5000 GT. 1963 Jaguar XKE Roadster. It's a 59 Alfa Romeo with a low nose. I can't pronounce all of the rest of the stuff that's in there. 58 Austin Martin DB2 Mark III. Beautifully shined up and maintained car. 1958 BMW 507. 1954 Jaguar XK SE. 1983 Ford Concept Geo Trio. It's a uh, seat three. 83 Ford Concept Gear Megastar Z. This is a 83 Ford Concept Gear Affair. This is the green 54 Pontiac Bonneville Special. You can see how this is the one I've seen before. Yeah, it, it would. 1941 Pontiac Streamliner Torpedo SD-CP. 
1957 Pontiac Star Chief. Through the bumper exhaust. Speaking of cats, I think the leopard skin bag. 1977 Pontiac Phantom. One of the things that's interesting is the little opening here in the side glass. There, Troy, Michigan, David Fisher, and his Absolute 57 fast Corvette back. convertible, and what a lovely 66 country. 66 Pontiac Banshee We're going to XP compare an original American production dream vehicle car. to its customized and leather. 89 and Pontiac Stinger. Gear shift so this the is open-sided. Uh, uh, 1992 Pontiac Lamborghini 400 GT. Sport 4. Well, um, so thanks, uh, for a four-door. This 1961 Pontiac Ventura, two four-barrel carburetors on probably a 421 engine. One of the things that was unique about these was the eight-bolt wheels. The uh, wheel came off on them eight bolts there. 63 Pontiac Grand Prix. Nice car. 1965 Pontiac Bonneville two-door hardtop. Really a long car. 1969 Pontiac Grand Prix SJ. 1990 Pontiac Sunfire. 1991 Pontiac Salsa Delivery. 2002 Pontiac Solstice Roadster. 2004 Pontiac GTO. 5.7 liter V8. 1966 Pontiac GTO. This is a custom done by Alexander Brothers. 1973 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. Ram Air. Extra things on the body there to make it more aerodynamic. 1968 Pontiac GTO. 1964 Pontiac GTO. Three two barrel carburetors. Period correct red line tires. Harvey Earl, Harley Earl, and his proteges. 1941 Lincoln Continental Coupe. Uh, just a really sleek lined coupe. 1962 Continental four door hardtop. 1957 Imperial Crown sedan. All of them were volunteers, and, and Jeff, of course, is our chief. 1955 Chrysler 300, the original Chrysler. 1955 Ford Thunderbird. There is a group of antique automobiles along here, vintage, and I just have to go along there and check all this out. 1927 Rolls Royce Phantom 1. The spring for the rear wheel. 1930 Cadillac V16 Cabriolet sedan by Fleetwood. 1931 LaSalle 345A Phaeton by Fleetwood. 1931 Franklin Pirate Phaeton. Really nice body lines. 34 Cadillac LaSalle convertible coupe by Fleetwood with the rumble seat open. 1928 Ram Page 835 Boat Tail Speeder Beatster by Hayes Hunt. Look at these tail lights here. Nineteen forty Packard Super Eight. Nineteen thirty one Rolls Royce P two. Nineteen thirty one Chrysler Imperial Closed Coupled Sedan. A General Motors Turbine Car. Nineteen thirty four Packard V twelve. Convertible coupe by Dietrich. What a beautiful Packard. 1937 Rolls Phantom 3. And you can see from the sleek front end to this, to this, 
Oh my gosh, what the hell did they do here? Tail end. Ice in a bag. This is really an unusual automobile. That emblem. On the Rolls Royce. 1927 Minerva. Hubbard and Darren limousine. 1929 Cord L29 convertible Phaeton. This is a uh, straight eight, front engine, front wheel drive. 1932 Chrysler Imperial. 1934 DeSoto Airflow. The, the DeSoto was the first with the airflow, but because of Chrysler thought that it was really something that he ought to have on his top of the line, he made the Chrysler's end airflow. 1937 Chrysler C19 Coupe airflow by moving the hood out and making it look so that it wasn't quite so airflowish that they made it so that it was more accepted by the people. 1938 Chrysler Imperial C19 convertible sedan. This means that it's four door, the top goes down. 1995 Chrysler Anante concept car. I always was always impressed by this car. One of the things that always set this off was the 22 inch wheels. 1955 Chrysler Falcon. The back side of the 55 Chrysler Kia Falcon. The 57 Chrysler Diablo. The 93 Chrysler Thunderbolt. There was also a 1940 Chrysler Thunderbolt. 1998 Chrysler Kronos. Chrysler 300 from 1991. Chrysler Design Pronto. This looks a lot like a PT Cruiser. 1999 Chrysler Citadel. 1952 Cadillac two passenger convertible. Cadillac Solitaire. Now this is a two door, two seat or four seated version of the, the Voyage. This has got a more sloped and rounded rear window and sloped deck. This is the sports utility concept of Chrysler's, I mean of Cadillac's. Cadillac Vision. Beautiful car. Cadillac Sion 12. This is a mid engined. Right back here is a uh, flip the little switch and behind the rear wheel to open up the door. Cadillac 16. The back side of the 16. A flathead Ford in it. From Wisconsin. A couple of uh, hot rods here. Nice fast back. Mr. Jim Bahari up on the lift. Now, your eyes in order to get a good view of what's going on here, he managed to talk these and people and into letting him get onto the, the lift. Okay, hello, my name is Dan Lavisa. I'm from Shelby Township, Michigan. And right here we have a 1975 Avanti 2. This is a continuation of the Studebaker Avanti, which started in 1963 and 1964. Uh, the design is timeless. It was designed by Raymond Lowy. This particular model here we bought in 1980, and that was my father that had bought this vehicle. It was a kind of a purple color, a repaint when we bought it, and this thing's been totally restored by us. The paint on this now is a Viper Red. So it was a, uh, this, this particular one's got a Chevy 400 engine in it, and they only made that for two years because it was such a powerful and gas-eating engine. In 75, we were entering into that oil crunch. Here is the Chrysler turbine car. Too. We have a 53 Pontiac Parisian. This car is a fire arrow, whatever that is. 
an interesting grill. All right, my name is Ed Crewall and I live in Romeo, Michigan. And you're looking at the end of a 10 year search as I tried to find the car that my wife and I went on our honeymoon back in 1950, actually 1960. This is a 59 Buick Electra 225. And what's unique about this particular car, although they call it a Riviera sedan, uh, it's really a four-door hardtop. And it has an unusual roof line. Most of the 59 Buicks had what I call a greenhouse roof, where the window was quite flat and wrapped around the back of the car. This car has the same roof and the same back window as the uh, Cadillac Fleetwood 60 Specials. The ratio that they built of these to the flat top was five to one. So it was a little harder to find. It took me 10 years to find it. I found it out in Cleveland, Ohio. It had a broken motor and a broken transmission and uh, a few holes in the body. So we went to work on it. It took us six months to restore it. And she's pretty much like she was the day she rolled off the assembly line now. And we're planning on putting a lot of miles on it and having a lot of fun. I'm Charles Johnny Couch. I'm from Manchester, Michigan. And it's a 48 Ford pickup. It's the first year for the F100. Henry Ford spent about a million dollars on this body style when they redesigned this in 48. I would like to show the dashboard and see kind of how it's mm -hmm. kind of a Spartan, Spartan interior, very functional. Yeah, it's original, it's original reproduction. Uh -huh. My name is Russell Doan. I'm from Menominee, Wisconsin, over west central Wisconsin. Uh, this car is a 1950 Lincoln Cosmopolitan Capri. This was Ford Motor Company's answer to the GM 1949 hardtops. The Cadillac Coupe de Ville, the Buick Roadmaster Riviera, and the Oldsmobile 98 Holiday. It really represented a trim package. There were only 509 of them built, and to my knowledge, there are three left that existed. Uh, this is the other car that I have here at the Eyes on Design show. This is a 1956 Continental Lincoln Mark II. I bought this car about 10 years ago over in Findlay, Ohio. I'm the third owner of it. I had the good fortune to uh, meet the lady who was the original owner and she was so happy that we were going to restore it. The car had been shown quite extensively at LCOC back in the late 60s and early 70s. These cars were built uh, for only two years, 56, 57. They were designed as a loss leader for Ford. The word is they lost $3,000 on every one they built because they were partially hand-built and of course very expensive to build. It has, as you notice, the body has somewhat the, um, the lines of the 55, 6, and 7 T-Bird. It was a very, very completely air, uh, equipped car uh, factory installed air conditioning, of course power seats, power windows, power steering, power brakes, power vents even it had. I'm Don Sullivan, I'm from Port Huron, Michigan, and this is my 57 GMC here. And uh, this truck here, originally when it came from, from truck and coach in Pontiac, it was an army truck. And uh, it spent a good share of its life as an army truck and then uh, it became uh, uh, part, of the, part of the National Forest Service and they pulled a water tanker with it. and. Then it ended up in a warehouse and got set on fire and I ended up getting it out of the warehouse and this is what it is today. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Hey, I'm David Harrison. This is my 1941 Buick Limited 7 passenger touring sedan. Bought this car about four months ago um, from a collector here in the Detroit area who had it for about 25 years. The car won its senior in 1977 and was repainted in the authentic two-tone combination of light over dark gray in 1980. Uh, before this show, we, we drove it out here about 700 miles from New York, and it performs beautifully on the highway, cruises at 70 all day long, and is really an excellent car and a great example of a 40s Buick. Sure, it's a 320 cubic inch straight eight, and what's interesting about the 1941 model is it has two carburetors in series. Normally it runs off of one carburetor, but when you put your foot all the way down, it kicks in the second carburetor for an extra bit of power. And what's unusual again for 1941, Buick actually had five horsepower more than the contemporary Cadillac. Hi, I'm Nicholas Pagani, and uh, I'm here with David Harrison with this 41 Buick, which we drove out from New York. And we were just discussing about the smell antique cars have. 
how certain vehicles all smell the same. What we've basically decided is it's a combination of the padding and the horsehair and mohair or wool that were involved in the production of the car. Earlier cars all smell the same. Earlier 60s cars all smell the same due to whatever vinyl they were using. And a lot of that smell is very, very um, aromatic. It's, it's a very distinctive odor, and they all smell the same. Uh, this, I'm Tom Goad from Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, this is my wife's car. We purchased in uh, 2001, uh, October 2001, at the Hershey auction. Uh, it's a 1930 Cadillac V16. Um, it uh, was a restoration done by a previous owner in the mid-70s. Uh, the only thing new on the car right now is we repl replaced the, uh, the fabric top material. Other than that, it's the uh, paint you see and the chrome is all 1970 vintage, just heavily detailed and cleaned up and lots of improvements to make the car run better, but it, and it's a great driving car. The toolbox and then the fake and then the battery box on the other yeah, side. Yeah, they just had the other one to, to balance the uh -huh. appearance. But they're very functional, very important. Uh -huh. Lots of big heavy tools you carry uh -huh. to, uh -huh. to change a tire on one of these cars. Uh -huh. I'm a Weaver. It's 1931 LaSalle. I've had it about six years. And where did you find it? Uh, in Toronto, Canada. It's your favorite car, I think. Yeah. The, the colors. The colors are different. <laughs> it's a 1931 LaSalle, actually, is what the uh, yeah, model. Yeah. My name is Guy Zaninovich, and this is a 1927 Rolls-Royce. It's a Springfield Phantom 1, meaning it was made in Springfield, Massachusetts. This car was originally owned by the Vanderbilt family, and is the only one made with this body style. In the automotive design of exceptional merit, the first winning vehicle in this category is the Phantom Corsair. This vehicle is on a, on a Ford 810 platform and powertrain, and it was designed by Russ Hines of the H.J. Hines family. And when you look at this, this is a 30s car, 1938 car. This was a real expression of design in terms of streamlining. You know, when you look at this sculptural, this is really a sculptural piece of rolling art. The lift-off roof panels, which we didn't see in cars till you know, many years later. To really appreciate this car, you've got to see the plan view. You know, this seats four across in the front and two in the back facing the rear. In the, the fastback profile, you know, the fully enclosed, fully enclosed wheels. A pleasure to uh, present on behalf of Dr. Chrysler the Automotive Design and of Excellence. Uh, merit Award to this 1956 Lincoln Continental Mark II. This car is one of only two, there are only two convertibles built. It represents really a transition from the uh, post-war heavier 1940s vehicles into the more slab side of the later and early 60s. I think it's a very beautiful car, beautiful proportion, long uh, dash to axle, very clean, low uh, ground hugging, uh, beautiful design. Thank you, Tom. And in its day, that was the most expensive American production car you could buy. It was $10,000 per. And according to the uh, Ford Centennial stuff that they sent out, they lost money on every one of them. We want to reintroduce you to our first commentator, Mr. Steve Pasteiner. 
And our winning vehicle is this beautiful 1934 Packard V12 convertible coupe from David Lindsay of Manawa, Wisconsin. Congratulations. Steve, what do you think of it? Well, Packards are certainly the top of the line in, in, uh, from the perspective of luxury and detail and, and being correct or being proper for uh, any kind of social event, even when you have something like this, which is, which is an incredible convertible. Um, when you study the lines on the car, for instance, the details as far as the uh, Packard grill and the theme of the Packard grill is repeated in the uh, in the headlights. Next, we want to introduce you to our second design commentator for today's awards, Mr. Jeff Godshaw, a winner in our Dream and Production Plymouth category. This award presented by SMA, a 1997 Plymouth Prowler Convertible. Uh, this vehicle, of course, was originally designed as a concept car out at the Chrysler Pacifica. Uh, Kevin Verdun was the was the principal designer on the exterior. Uh, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, concept car turned into production car, and certainly going to be very collectible in the years to come. This is in the Cadillac and LaSalle category. This is rich in indulgence. The award is presented by Bridgestone Firestone and Steve. This is a beauty, 1960 Eldorado Baritz convertible. Design trends for uh, throughout the 50s uh, led up to the. Uh, longer, wider, lower look, and certainly uh, this car epitomizes that by the time 1960 has arrived. Uh, the uh, fins, the 59 fins, which were quite outrageously too high, you know, were uh, brought back a little bit more reasonably. From DuPont Automotive, the award presented for our Dream and Production Chrysler Imperial and DeSoto category, a 1955 Chrysler C300. Yes, this, uh, this car was designed under the auspices of Virgil Exner, who came over from Studebaker in 1949 to head Chrysler Experimental Styling. He was appointed Director of Design in 1953 and later Vice President of Styling, but as Director of Design, he was responsible for the entire 1955 line of Chrysler Corporation cars, which were collectively called the Forward Look. Um, and of course, this is a very special Chrysler of all the Chryslers in 55. This is a C300, which was introduced mid-year with its uh, 300 horsepower engine, with the idea of it sort of being a gentleman's, a gentleman's hot rod. This is our dream in production, Pontiac and GMC, a 1968 Pontiac GTO two-door hardtop. And Steve, this is a classic. Indeed, it is a classic, you know, and, and there are so many things that were newly introduced on this vehicle that uh, were indeed trendsetters. If you look at the front grille or the, the front surround, this is the first car in production that had the um, matching body color bumpers, which is now uh, on virtually every car, as well as the hideaway headlights. And then they were also advertising the, uh, the hideaway windshield wipers so that the hood was extended far enough so that the wipers were down below. Now, a lot of these things we look at as well, we've seen those things before, but for that time period, this was the newest and latest and greatest thing. This is a very, very significant car. Obviously, the GTOs were credited to be the, uh, the large engine in a small car. It's very high performance, and uh, it's, it, this is a very desirable model. The uh, winner in the Ford and Edsel Dream in production category, this is a beautiful 1931 Ford Model A Victoria. This was typical of the kind of car you would see when the Model A's were being built. The black wall tires, black wheels, black fenders, um, a, a body in, in, a, in a subdued color. Uh, this is the way they would really look when you, if you go back into the 1930s and see a typical street scene. It is a 1929 Auburn and it's a thing of beauty and this is in our independence category. Uh, Auburn uh, was, a, was a, um, a make that was uh, taken over by E.L. Ford. He also owned Duesenberg and Auburn Ford and Duesenberg cars were, were built in the 20s and 30s and were uh, great examples of what a small independent manufacturer can do in really setting styling trends. Uh, Auburn was the master of the boat tail. Mm -hmm. The way the, the body comes to a point in the back, they did several iterations. Um, they, were, they were the master of this body style. Other people did boat tails, but none as good as the Auburn. Auburn was also known for their very large headlights, uh, enormous oversized headlights. This is one of the distinctive uh, style signatures of the mark. And also the, um, the round bumper, which is another, uh, another thing that um, you look for in an Auburn. This is a beautiful Hemi, a 1968 Dodge Charger in our Dream of Production Dodge category. Um, this was um, 
a very, very significant car for Dodge, and they brought out the first Charger in 66 and a half, which was really a remake, a restyle of the 66 Coronet. And um, for 1968, um, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were all new B-bodies, right, as they called them in Chrysler parlance, and um, the Dodge boys were able to get a completely different set of tools for a unique B-body that was not shared with Plymouth or with the, with the Dodge Coronet. And this is the charge of the result of this double diamond. You can see the, 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 the first diamond is, the, is the, are the fenders, rear fender, merging into the second diamond on the front fender. There's also, the plan view is also similar uh, in a diamond shape. Also notice the uh, flying buttress roof with the, with the uh, roof panels sweeping rearward of the, of the backlight. And of course, the, uh, the charger was very clean at the front with its uh, disappearing headlights. Uh, recess scoops and there are turn signals right here instead of being on the instrument panel. And uh, this is still a beautiful automobile. It still defines what a Charger is. It is the essence of a performance car. Presented by Delphi, 1970 Chevrolet SS 454 two-door sport coupe. Uh, throughout the late 60s, uh, you know, the, the muscle cars and, and the uh, performance image became so important. It was such a hot seller. And uh, obviously Chevrolet was one of the great leaders in, in high performance. And uh, when you're looking at something like this, it, it probably ruled Woodward at one time or other. The 454 engine cowl induction, which means, uh, if you read it there, it obviously will tell the, the guy next to you when you're drag racing him, the um, little flipper comes up and it introduces ram air into the engine. So it, it was kind of like tattooing performance all over yourself. Well, from a design standpoint, it, is a, it's, it was quite a style leader. And again, when you're looking at these type of shapes, which are quite wheel-oriented, um, a lot of the current imports have picked up on that look. If you think this light at the end of the tunnel is a train, you're half right. This is a parade of progress bus, and it owes a lot of its design cues to a locomotive. And it is a thing of beauty and truly unique. This is a bus that went from town to town beginning in 1936, bringing the message of progress, technological innovation, and design to millions of people. Now, this was designed to be kind of a traveling medicine show in the mid-50s. Look at the light bridge that extends out of the top of the bus. Now, this would cast a glow of light over the whole area so that they could do their presentation. And what would happen is this uh, scene here would swing down, this part swings up, and then you had an entire scientific and technological exposition inside this bus. Uh, GM uh, put in their military uh, drive line. It's a 30, uh, 302 inline six-cylinder engine coupled to a military hydromatic, which, uh, which is, has two upper range and a lower range, so it gives you eight options. In addition, there's another gearbox in the back that's uh, shifted manually. You have to be stopped to shift it. It has an underdrive, a one-to-one -one ratio, and an overdrive. In addition to that, that rear gearbox disconnects the rear wheels and in the back of this is a large generator that powers, gives you all the power to operate the doors, the light bar on top, and all the displays on the inside. Both of these vehicles have just uh, had overwhelming response. Uh, you know, if you look at this vehicle, this is sort of a direction of where, you know, Chevrolet trucks are going. You know, obviously, from the front, it's very much a Chevrolet truck. It has that tough, rugged look, but done in a very contemporary, very sculptural, you know, set of forms. We feel that this truck really advances the design dimension of full-size trucks. And the interior of this vehicle is just absolutely outstanding. Obviously a five-seater vehicle. It's got side-loading doors on it for the, for the pickup box. It's got a number of features in the back, a split tailgate. You know, the roof is open on the vehicle. It just shows a lot of innovation and a lot of features. I'm sure you're going to be seeing in trucks in years to come. Well, please welcome Ann Incenzio, who is uh, one of the leading designers at uh, GM. She's executive director of the Advanced Vehicle Design at GM Design here at the Tech Center, and uh, she is exiting that beautiful GM16, bringing back the V16 in high style. And this car, like for every designer, it's all about proportion. Look at that. Look at the profile. The profile is absolutely gorgeous. This car, without any doubt, will um, will be one of the most important milestones in the history of automotive design. Thank you very much.
And we have here a beautiful 1953 Buick Skylark convertible scheme. Well, GM has decided to build, Buick has decided to build a limited number of these vehicles, and it's in the range of around 840, I think. But um, what is so special about it is that it's, it is really a factory-built custom car, and the windshield is substantially lower than a production car. The belt line, which means the, the horizontal line along where the window, the base of the window, has kind of a dip to it, which makes it a lot sportier than, than Ben Perrin. Even the interior is, is uh, special. It looks like it has an engine turned uh, finish to the interior. And uh, it, it was a very expensive car. It was actually uh, more expensive than many of the Cadillacs of that period. This is a magnificent 1951 Hudson Wasp hardtop. This uh, vehicle, the original body stop came out in 1948. It was Hudson's first unitized body construction. It was called the Step Down Hudson because when you open the door, you actually step down into the car, which is one reason why the six-cylinder Hornet was able to hold its own, or more than hold its own, uh, in stock car races alongside the, uh, the Rocket, uh, Rocket V8 Oldsmobiles. Uh, this car was designed by Frank Spring. It was, um, the basic body was conceived during, uh, the, during the war, during World War II, and it was put in production in 1948. Um, also at the front, uh, Hudson's uh, signature uh, triangle. One of the things that was so much fun when I was a kid is that uh, these Hudson medallions would be lit at night with the headlights. It was one of the uh, things that Hudson kept clear till the end of 1957. Um, Hudson was uh, unfortunately not able to, uh, to change this body style. They kept restyling it every year, and uh, that didn't work for them ultimately, so they ended up merging with Nash to form American Motors in 1954. 1937 Lincoln T convertible sedan. I know this are uh, near and dear to your heart, Steve. Well, uh, what was so interesting about this time period for these cars is this portion of it, the forward portion of it, is a factory built vehicle. The rear portion of it was farmed out to special bodybuilders and the customer could generally order up the special details and so on. Even though if it's a limited edition or limited run of factory uh, or custom bodies, custom cultural bodies. Um, and what makes it interesting is, is in the late 30s these headlights were starting to get integrated into the fenders and somehow it may look slightly like it was grafted on but it it also gave an incredibly deep area down here between the fender and the hood. It was called, actually it was called the catwalk. These were just some of the most exciting Oldsmobiles of the era because particularly, again, yes, you do have all the performance tattooed on the outside and so on, and, and you can tell that this is quite a high performance car. But throughout the, the surface development, throughout the car, the way the rear window slopes into the uh, deck profile, into the uh, trunk area, and the way that wraps on there, that's very contemporary, even in today's uh, design standards. And when you're looking at, this is called the D-line, I and mean, it's, it's a drip line, but the way this loops around, it's a very graceful example. And lately, if you're looking at a lot of these show cars, or, or these concept cars, the pronounced wheel opening, that were popularized in 1968 are in fact still one of the major design features in today's so-called futuristic uh, looking cars. Mr. Earl designed the first one in 53. This is a 57 Corvette convertible. David Fisher of Troy, Michigan. Congratulations, it's a beauty. Steve? It's, uh, it, it's beautifully executed. It's, it's one of the nicest, simplest designs that's totally understandable. You have the air intake in the center, you have single headlight, you have the cove that just kind of gives you a, an accelerated view of a, a teardrop shape, the wraparound windshield, the color combination is typically 50s. Uh, it looks like it's a four-speed, well, it's three-speed, and it's fuel injected. I mean, it, it doesn't really get any better than that. No. From Troy, Michigan, David Fisher and his 57 Corvette convertible, and what a lovely teal color that is. This is the fun category. This is called stock. This is our stock entry. First up on our platform, a 1957 Buick Roadmaster, Jim Heiser from Corona, with our stock entry behind it, the 1957 Buick Special Two-Door Hardtop. 
fully customized, fully done out, Anthony Catanacci of Fraser, Michigan with that one. And Jeff, uh, let's point out the, the differences and the similarities in these two. Our stock vehicle, of course, is the 1957 Buick. It built on the very successful uh, sweep spear theme that uh, Buick um, uh, built into their 1954 cars with the full wheel openings front and rear. This was something rather unusual in American design back then. Oftentimes you'll find the rear wheels buried under skirts or something, but on Buicks they were fully exposed. You can see that the, um, the sweep spear is actually molded into the body side. There's actually a, a ridge in the body side to which the, uh, the sweep spear is applied, so it's actually uh, in the body design itself and not uh, just pasted on. America one day, the, was it the Jeep Liberty? Oh, it was the SSR. She called it a bitchin' car on national television. A, oh no, bitchin' truck. I thought that Diane Sawyer was going to fall off her jewel-encrusted perch after she heard that. But Jean calls them as she sees them. Our next category, Dream and Production Sports. A 1968 Lamborghini 400 GT. The uh, touring body, when you see Super Leger on this, it, it's a uh, special construction of a, almost like a fine wire mesh of substance uh, defining the body shape and then they hang the body panels on it. Uh, Turing was, was probably one of the most outstanding uh, bodybuilders or coach builders uh, of the 30s and 40s and by the time 60s got around he was uh, about to go out of business but some of the most fabulous alpha males and things uh, are all Turing body cars. This is a wonderful example with, with quite an overstated windshield angle and the windshield uh, plan view, it's virtually a round plan view, the tapering uh, rear end and, and quite a dynamic uh, profile. It's a very elegant execution of a grand touring car. The wide uh, rimmed aluminum wheels, knockoff uh, wheels are, are also just exceptional for this and, and truly Lamborghini became uh, quite a competitor to Ferrari and, and uh, this is one of the first examples of those vehicles. As you know, uh, Daimler Chrysler, if you happen to look at their exhibit over uh, to the north, has a rich history of concept vehicle design. These guys are among the best at short turnaround because we know from covering them year after year that when you see a concept, it isn't long before you see the production and you're often uh, you're full of surprises. But this one, I played golf with Chuck Fortenberry on Monday and the Chrysler dealers are licking their chops over getting the production version of this vehicle in their showrooms and it's a beauty, the Chrysler Crossfire. The uh, inspiration for the interior and exterior of the Crossfire concept really goes back to uh, the 30s and Art Deco. And if you look at any of the other uh, vehicles that you see here today, the Phantom Corsair and some of those other vehicles, you can see a similarity in the shape, vocabulary, and the surface language. Now please welcome Mr. Ralph Gilles. He's Diamond Chrysler's Director of Exteriors and Interiors. Studio 3, Chrysler Chronos, and the Chrysler 300C. And there you have the beautiful Chrysler Chronos and the Chrysler 300C concept. Kind of a uh, modern interpretation of a classic proportion. Um, and it's taking the art of daring, you know, the, what is truly American. If you look at the belt line on the vehicle, again, much like the Chronos, it's very, very high. And I guess this really no, needs no introduction anyway, because the winner in the privately owned concept vehicle is this beautiful, I believe it is a 53, would that be right? A 53 Chevrolet Corvette, a concept vehicle from GM that marked the beginning of a 50-year uh, legend. And Jeff, tell us about it. Well, this is, this is indeed a very, very special automobile, because this is the original uh, Motorama show car that was debuted at the Waldorf Astoria uh, in 1953, I believe January, and this is the original, the original Corvette. Um, it, um, you know, the the reason for this car is because when the GIs came back from Europe, you know, they had been exposed to some of the British sports cars, and of course, in the late 40s, you got to see uh, MG TDs uh, coming in and Jaguar XK120s, and of course, Harley Earl uh, 
uh, very, being very, very creative, wanted to see what he could do uh, over a Chevrolet chassis with a, with a similar vehicle. And the Corvette here, the show car was the result. Um, this, this car originally came with the, the Blue Flame 6, and that's how it was produced for, for two years. And then it was fitted with a V8 engine, the Ed Cole, famous Ed Cole V8. This particular car has a V8 engine because after it was through being a show car, it was used for experimental purposes. And it was uh, sort of productionized to look like a regular uh, 53 or 54 or 55 Corvette. This is a fiberglass car. That's how they can get these kind of forms. You certainly can't stamp this kind of thing in sheet metal. All this is uh, very carefully laid up. And uh, it's got the wraparound windshield. It's got the double cowl instrument panel. It's a beautiful car, both inside and outside. The two flow together. It was the beginning of the, of course, the beginning of the Corvette. And of course, this inspired the Ford Thunderbird. Uh, by the way, the Thunderbird was not as successful as the Corvette. They even considered, uh, well, pardon me, the Thunderbird was more successful than the Corvette. And of course, when they made it into a four-seater, really took off. But Corvette stayed with the, um, with the original formula of a two-seater sports car, even though uh, there was some talk in 55 of dropping it. Instead, they, they continued with the, with the brand, and of course, we still have Corvettes to admire and enjoy today. A car I never expected to see, and where else would you see such a vehicle except at Eyes on Design. Thank you for bringing it.